Welcome to this video where we are talking about the INICT psychiatry related questions which came in May 2022. Let's jump into the questions and try to understand what we can learn from these questions. A patient diagnosed with schizophrenia was started on risperidone. After last night's dose, the patient presented today with upward gaze. What is the management is the question. So here they've asked about management. The keywords you should look into is the patient is having psychosis, schizophrenia and is started on antipsychotic like risperidone. A single dose has been given and he presents the next day with upward gaze palsy. So what is happening? So it looks like some kind of an acute extra pyramidal side effect is happening, right? What exactly is happening here? We are talking about acute dystonia which is happening. Now what is acute dystonia? Acute dystonia is what happens when a group of muscles are kind of contracted. Depending on which group of muscles we are talking about, you could have the oculogyric acute dystonia, you could have torticollis, you could have truncal dystonia, you can also have the orolingual dystonia. You can sometimes end up having even laryngeal dystonia which could be very lethal because of the asphyxia. So this, in this question, the person is having upward gaze palsy. So what are they talking about? They are mostly talking about oculogyric crisis in this person who has taken respiridone. So now that you identified it, how do you manage it? Basically, the management of this condition is by giving two things. One is antihistaminics or anticholinergics, preferably in injectable form. So this is where one of the commonest medication or treatment we use is called as promethazine. And promethazine is an antihistaminic which can be extremely helpful in these patients. In fact, within about half an hour to one hour of giving the injection, the patient might completely be better and feeling much, much better better. So that's the advantage of diagnosing the right diagnosis and giving the right treatment. Please remember, you don't need to be a psychiatrist, but you might be in your emergencies and casualties or in medical OPDs, seeing such kind of patients who might come with dystonia, which is acute in onset, most probably started on an antipsychotic. So diagnose it as acute dystonia and consider giving promethazine, which could be helpful in these patients to manage this condition. Okay. So the answer for this question is a very simple promethazine. In the next question, on performing polysomnography in a patient with sleep issues, they have seen the EEG recording and the EOG recording. Now, they have asked which stage of sleep does the person belong to? REM, N1, N2, N3. Now, if you really look at, they are talking about sawtooth appearance of waves and they are also talking about uh, eye movements. So when they're talking about eye movements and sawtooth appearance of waves, we know we are talking about REM sleep because in REM sleep, you typically see eye movements and sawtooth appearance of waves. A few in important points you should remember which can be tested in exam are related to the EEG and sleep. So let me keep it very simple. When somebody is awake, you typically see beta waves in the frontal areas of the brain and the central areas of the brain. Whereas in the occipital area, to some extent you can have the alpha waves. So the alpha waves can be typically seen little bit in the occipital area. Otherwise, every part of the brain is typically your front, um, beta waves which are seen. The moment somebody closes their eyes and actually starts focusing or meditating or chanting or doing some kind of a pranayama, the moment they close their eyes, they have a lot of alpha waves activity throughout the brain. So the alpha wave which would be in the occipital area when they are awake is typically kind of going to spread over to the rest of the brain when you close your eyes and start focusing or doing some kind of meditation. So the moment you get into sleep, which is the light sleep, N1 sleep, you start seeing theta waves and in N2 sleep, you typically see the sleep spindles and K complexes. They do ask about sleep spindles and K complexes. So let's try to understand what it is. When you're talking about K complex and sleep spindles, you need to understand both of them happen in the N2 stage of sleep. And most important point about K complex is it is a high amplitude wave or a high voltage wave and it is a low frequency wave and it's a low frequency wave it's a biphasic wave there's a negative deflection as well as a positive deflection so the wave will typically look like a small negative deflection followed by a complex positive wave which comes so it's a biphasic wave it has high voltage and it is 
low in frequency. That's very characteristic of K-complex which happens in N2 stage of sleep. So when you're talking about sleep spindles, again, it's a low amplitude or a low voltage wave, but a high frequency wave. Generally about 12 to 14 hertz is the range at which it will be. It will typically be in the alpha wave range. Sometimes up to 12 to 14 hertz it will be. It's a burst of waves which kind of comes and goes. It's a kind of burst of waves which kind of comes and goes and this is how typically it would appear to you on the EEG. So the moment you see a K-complex or a um, sleep spindle in the EEG then you understand the patient is mostly in the N2 stage of sleep. So what happens in the N3 stage of sleep? You see the theta waves is what you need to understand. Of course in the REM we also said that the patient is having sawtooth appearance of waves. So these are some important points you need to know which can be tested in exam. Moving ahead to the next question, a 29 year old lady came to a psychiatry OPD with symptoms of hypomania. There is a past history of episode of mania. Now she is planning to conceive. Which should uh, which drug should be avoided is what they've asked. So basically they're talking about some kind of a bipolar disorder and they're asking which drug should you be avoiding here. So they've given valproate, oxcarbazepine, lamotrigin, lithium. Now you don't need to know about bipolar disorder, uh, but in general, you need to understand valproate is something which should be typically avoided in reproductive age group women. In reproductive age group women, you should try to avoid valproate. One of the reasons is because many, many times studies have shown 50% of the pregnancies could be unplanned. It is one of the very teratogenic agent. So if you look at the mood stabilizers here. The mood stabilizers we typically use in bipolar disorder are lithium, valproate, carbamazepine or the oxcarbazepine and of course you have the lamotrigine. The most important drugs we typically avoid are valproate and carbamazepine for sure. Of course oxcarbazepine being another drug similar to carbamazepine that is also tried to avoid it. You need to know that in your pharmacology you would have read about lithium causing Epstein's anomaly that's also sometimes asked in exam. So don't forget lithium can cause Epstein's anomaly but can you give lithium in pregnant women? Over years what they have noticed is the rate of uh, Epstein's anomaly is not very high in patients who are taking lithium so they know that maybe you can still go ahead and give lithium if lithium has to be given and you should take some precautions especially just after the delivery the fluid levels will change you need to avoid lithium toxicity so if you have to give lithium you can still consider giving lithium but valproate and carbamazepine are typically avoided so the answer for that question was valproate right so which is the safest mood stabilizer we have the safest mood stabilizer we have is lamotrigine lamotrigine is the safest mood stabilizer we have. So these are common questions which are asked in this area. Which of the following is false about bipolar disorder? Which of the following statement is false about bipolar disorder? So what are these statements? It, it most commonly affects the age group of 35 to 45. Type 1 is common in both genders, well as type 2 is most common in females. Prevalence in the general population is about 1% to 2%. Suicide attempt is about 5 to 10% are the statements which are given. So before you kind of answer this question, let me tell you some brief aspects which will make you answer this question easily. So if you look at mood disorders, few interesting points you need to know is prevalence, gender, age of onset and suicide rates. Now when you're talking about prevalence, we know depression is way more common than bipolar disorder. 5 to 15 percent of the population can have depression at least once in lifetime. So when you're talking about bipolar disorder, it is about 0.5 to 1 percent in the general population. So depression is almost like 5 times more common to 10 times more common than bipolar disorder. When you're talking about gender, females have more risk for developing depression as well as bipolar type 2 whereas bipolar 1 is kind of equiprevalent in both the genders so bipolar 1 is equiprevalent bipolar type 2 and your depression is more prevalent in female gender when you talk about the age of onset the typical dictum you need to understand is see it doesn't mean depression will not happen in young children or um, bipolar will not happen in elderly people for the first time. It can happen at any age group but generally speaking what we know is bipolar disorder generally starts off a decade below, I mean a decade before depression. 
bipolar disorder generally starts off a decade before depression that's something which we need to know so approximately we, what we know is 15 to 25 years the late adolescents and young adults typically can have the first episode of bipolarity whereas 25 to 35 years is the time when typically they can have the first episode of depression so depression generally comes a little later whereas bipolar disorder comes a little early majority of the times understood with respect to suicide we know both the mood disorders that is uh, depression as well as your uh, bipolar disorder have about 15% uh, have about 15% okay so talking about suicide you need to understand it's about 15% in mood disorders so about 15% of the people with mood disorders can succumb to suicide with this point you can realize that this statement is the false statement whereas the rest of the statement can be kind of understood is more true statements understood so the answer for this question is it is most commonly affecting age 35 maybe this is what happens in patients with depression depression patients could have it at this age group whereas bipolar can have it around 15 to 25 age group getting it so going to the next question which is exclusively seen in females red syndrome asperger syndrome selective mutism atypical mutism atypical mutism simple dictum you need to know is all kinds of autism spectrum disorder are more commonly seen in males all kind of autism spectrum disorders are more commonly seen in males but of course except red syndrome when you're talking about red syndrome what are we talking about red syndrome is a kind of x linked condition the gene which is affected is the MECP2 gene. These children are having short stature, sometimes can have microcephaly and they can have a normal development for about six months to three years after which they have regression of the milestones. Regression of the milestones. A very classical feature in these patients is midline stereotypic behaviors, right? This is the midline of the individual. So midline stereotypic behaviors are something which can be typically seen in these patients. That is something which you should know, which can be asked in exam multiple times and it is good for you to know. With this, we can kind of come to the end of this short video on the May 2022 INICT recall of psychiatric questions. Thank you very much.